everybody. Uh, my name is Trisha George, and I am the Director of Teen Services at Hartford Public Library. Um, Hartford Public Library is located in Hartford, Connecticut. It is a capital city. Um, we have six public libraries um, with physical location at physical locations and one mobile bookmobile. Um, we have two U Media learning labs, one at our central downtown library that's a pretty large enclosed space intended for 13 to 19 year olds, the other at our Albany library branch um, that is a kind of smaller satellite. Um, the Hartford Public Library has um, been nominated. We were a finalist for the National Medal for Museum and Library Services in 2014. Um, we have nationally recognized work in immigration and citizenship services. Um, and if I if I could say so myself, I think we're doing pretty well on the teen front. Um, today, I'm here to talk to you just a little bit about uh, programming. Um, Melanie and I uh, talked a little bit about the mobile labs that you have set up and some of the work that you're trying to do with those. Um, I'm going to give you kind of the broad overview of how we approach working with young people, specifically teens and young adults in libraries. And then I'm going to um, kind of give you the back stage glance at how we do programming. Um, I also am giving you access to all of the programs that we've ever created. Um, it will be a little bit overwhelming, um, but it is a robust and useful set of information um, that we can work our way through a little bit today. Um, so without any further ado, one of these buttons has to make it go forward. Okay, there we go. Um, who are you? Um, I see four folks here, um, and two of them are me and Melanie. <laughs> so, um, Maria and Natalia, uh, what do you all do in the library system? Maria, your mic is active. You can go ahead and speak. If you have a mic on your end. You don't have a mic. Would you like to tell us, go ahead and type in what you do? And then Natalia as well. Okay, super. How many, Maria, how many libraries do you coordinate technology for? I'm pretty sure it's two libraries, right, Maria? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Super. Super. Natalia, you want to go ahead and tell us what you do? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, I can. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, so I'm a library technician at the Oakland Park Library. Um, right now, I'm I'm kind of covering. Uh, my responsibilities and the responsibilities of the youth service librarian. Um, but hopefully we'll get somebody soon. <laughs> okay, super. Um, and then David, uh, it looks like your mic is also active. Um, if you wouldn't mind, could you share with us what you do? Oh. <laughs> I scared him off. Sorry. You can type it in if you like, David. Yeah, that's fine too. Oh, back. Once we fight through this kind of awkward communication um, stuff at the beginning, we will be able to have a more robust conversation later on. So I think it's worth it um, to push through this a little bit. David, can you hear us or could you respond and let us know um, in the chat or by talking uh, what your role is at the libraries? Oh, okay, super. Um, then typing is absolutely fine. I can, I can see it. I think everybody can see it. Um, we can always echo it back to the group. Just your role at the library, David. Mm -hmm. I don't know, David, I can call in now. It's Maria. So you might want to see if you can call in too. That way you can talk to people. <laughs> yeah, I think. Okay. Super. Awesome. 
Okay, great. So um, we have folks mostly focused on teens, um, and there are two libraries in the system. Um, and I think that Melanie and I are the are the only administrators. True. Um, yeah. That's so correct. Super. Okay. So this should be um, very relevant to. Okay, Maria, also in admin. Super. Okay. Okay. Um, there's a little bit of everything for you guys in here. Um, so the first thing that I'm going to talk about is hashtag goals, right? Um, the best way to get where you're going is to first know where it is, right? Um, so you media, our goals are to support connected learning. Um, increase technology access and eliminate opportunity gaps. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about what each of those means. So um, connected learning is a learning theory um, that we'll talk about that involves um, the way that you design learning opportunities, but also how you position learning opportunities within a physical community. Um, in, an increase in access to technology we think is key um, to ensuring that young people have the skills that they need to be successful in a 21st century workforce. Um, and then eliminating opportunity gaps. Um, we come from the perspective that um, every young person can achieve if they are given an opportunity to do so. And we position ourselves as providers of opportunities. Um, now we're going to dive a little bit deeper into these, right? So. Um, when we're talking about the actual goals that we have for the programs that we run, um, and I, I understand that this is kind of um, big and far away, um, but we we will drill down into the nitty gritty and how each of the programs kind of comes back to build on these things. Um, we have outcomes um, in the short, mid, and long term for individuals, connected learning, technology access, and opportunities, right? Um, ideally, our young people are pursuing post-secondary certification in an area that they really love. They're eventually getting employment in one of those fields. Um, they have access to a regular, they have regular access to a computer or mobile device, so it's not something that they have to come to the library necessarily to get. Um, and then the kind of big thing that we want to see happen is that Hartford's overall Opportunity Index score improves. If you are not familiar with the Opportunity Index score, it might be something you're interested in looking into. Um, a group goes through um, data and assigns an Opportunity Score to municipalities across the country. Um, those scores are based on things like community stability, income, unemployment, um, uh, high or low rates of um, immigrant populations or um, American or foreign born populations. Um, and it, it can be really useful to better understand um, what is happening in your community and how you might um, adjust programming. So out of curiosity, um, do any of these look like some of the goals that you have? Even if your goals are in your head, um, they're not necessarily written down, you're not necessarily moving actively towards them, um, it's a thing that you would like to see, um, do these align with the things that you are hoping to do as, as librarians um, working with youth and young adults? Feel free to speak up or type it in the, the chat box. And feel free to say no. <laughs> The short oh, Go ahead. Um, so edge to rate our tech and the goals align as well. Okay. Um, and you think that the short term goals really are what you're looking at, David. Okay, cool. Um, so then the good news is that for at least for um, David, um, we can support um, your work in those short-term goals um, and maybe give you a kind of framework for aiming for some of those mid- or, and long-term goals. So, Yeah, I, I definitely agree with 
with the outcomes that I would want. Although for the long term, I, I have a hard time seeing the owning and having regular access to a computer, you know, at home. That to me sounds like a tough thing because of the, you know, the, the digital gap that some people experience. Yes, absolutely. Um, it, it, that is certainly a tough one. Um, but we will, um, we can talk about um, the kind of ways that we make that happen. Um, I'm going to just write that down really quickly so I can address it later. Okay, moving on. So, I think that is part of what the library can provide as well, access to a computer there. Yes, absolutely. Um, the library does a great job of providing access to technology um, during the day when we're open. Um, and, uh, you know, we are looking to go just a little bit further past that to ensure when young people are at home um, needing to work on something or on Sundays or when the library is closed because there's an awesome snowstorm, um, that they still have access um, to those learning tools um, and work materials. So um, before we dive in specifically to programs, I want to help build the foundational view of what we do. Um, all of the work um, that folks in the UMedia National Network and at um, my site, both in the UMedia space and in team services across all six of our locations, um, are based on research. They're research informed, right? So the big one is um, connected learning. Um, and this is the idea that uh, young people learn in a lot of different spaces in a lot of different ways. And as adults, it is our responsibility to be the guides that help connect them to the resources, right? Um, so on the screen, you can see um, there are uh, a whole bunch of well, six different principles, right? Um, the three yellow ones are design principles and the three um, blue ones are learning principles. Um, by a quick, um, does this have the hand raise feature? Um, yes, by a quick show of hands, um, could if, if you've seen this before, could you raise your fake hand? Okay, so I either, I either can't see it or nobody raised their hand. <laughs> I'm sorry, what exactly have we seen before? I missed it. I'm asking if you've seen this graphic about connected learning before. Oh, okay, then I haven't personally. Okay, super. Okay, I'm going to take that as a no, and we're going to go ahead and dive into it. Um, so connected learning is kind of a way of building um, local context um, and regional context about around the work that you're doing, right? So um, let's jump first into the learning principles. Um, I'm going to start with interest powered. Um, if you've ever worked with a teenager, it can be a lot like leading a horse to water. Um, you can take that horse there, but you cannot make that horse drink. Um, you can show a young person something that is awesome and good, um, and you cannot necessarily get them to use it, right? Um, unless they're interested. So all of the work that we do, all of the programs that we build are first considered, um, we first considered what young people are interested in. Right. Um, I will we'll talk more deeply about interests later um, and then peer supported uh, in the next learning theory that we talk about Hamago. Um, we talk about hanging out being just as important as geeking out. Right. Young people, especially in the teen to young adult phase, are very much building social identities. They're very much trying to form new families and separate from those kind of traditional structures that they've been brought up into. They're making their own place in the world and the people who are helping them do that is a community of peers. And so when we as uh, kind of guides to learning and people who give access to learning materials are designing these things, we need to make sure 
that peers can support other peers. If what we're doing is always individual, if what we're doing is always independent, um, our young people are going to shy away from that because they really um, developmentally are in a place where they're, de they're trying to work more with their peers. Um, and then academically oriented, right? Um, this might not be something that every young person asks for, but this is something that is very good for young people to understand, right? Any kind of learning that they're doing can support academic learning. If we are working with a young person um, creating a video, there is inevitably reading and writing that takes place. There are inevitably, if you're editing a video, um, perhaps you're counting down to um, a sound that happens on a specific beat, there is math involved in that, right? And even if it's not algebra or geometry or trig, um, we're still working with them on mathematical thought processes, right? On computational thought processes, on um, linear or uh, language-based thinking. Um, so we want to always ensure uh, that the work that we're doing, even if it's not obvious to the young person, has some kind of academic foundation. Moving on to the design principles, um, and this is maybe my, uh, what I think is the most important part of all of this um, is openly networked, right? Um, starting a media is kind of like planting a seed that spreads through a local network of museums and schools and community organizations um, and other stakeholders in the attempt to build a learning ecosystem. Um, if a young person comes to us and is interested in the program that's happening about bikes at the um, local BC Co organization, we will do our best to connect that young person to a caring adult within that organization, right? Um, then <laughs> those networks that we built, um, we're also trying to build networks that contain all six of these principles. So when we're working um, with BC Co, and um, we're referring a young person to uh, um, Joe, who runs that program, we are referring that young person to a production-centered program. Um, so let's say Lisette is interested in working with BC Co because she needs a bike to ride to work. We connect her to the BC Co program where um, she pays $20 and is able to build a bike, get a lock, um, get a light, um, and then at the end of a two-week program, she has a bicycle, right? Um, and now, not only does she have a bicycle, she also has transportation to work, and she knows somebody else at that organization. Not only does that benefit the set, now I have a closer to connection to the person at that organization, and Joe has a closer connection to us. So we are able to send young people back and forth through those things. I know... Um, Library, libraries are really great at sharing with other libraries. Um, and I think that this idea of openly networked learning ecosystems is great for libraries um, because we're already doing that work with each other. Um, now we can kind of expand it into our community partners who also meet these same um, kind of principles, right? Um, we've covered production-centered. Young people want to be doing things. Um, this is not a lecture type of program, but I assume as librarians you already know that. Um, and then shared purpose, right? Um, the best way to motivate a young person to complete a thing is to give them a purpose, right? This is not about um, you learning per se, um, but this is about your voice being heard or you and your peers' voices being heard. This is about changing a thing that's happening that you don't like. Um, this is about you know, um, celebrating something even. It doesn't have to have a civic engagement um, lens necessarily. It could really be about um, making sure that you're celebrating uh, all of the birthdays in the month of July. Um, as long as you have that group of young people doing something together um, and connecting not all at first, but whatever organizations you possibly can connect them to, um, this is what connected learning looks like. Um, I said a billion things, um, and I just want to say that if you take just one thing from this, um, is that in the connected learning theory, um, they suggest that we think of education as a process of guiding youth's active participation in public life. 
right? So we're not yes necessarily learn teaching them how to use a video camera. Um, we are teaching them how using a video camera um, can help them further participate in public life. Um, so I want to stop for a second. Um, I will go ahead and say if you have any questions about this specifically, type it into the box and I will answer it. Um, but I would like to ask you to choose one of the design principles, so either openly networked, production-centered, or shared purpose, and consider what about it would be beneficial to the youth with whom you work. Um, please share that um, either out loud or by typing in the chat box. So while you folks are um, thinking about the, um, while you are working on choosing a design principle and typing out what about it is beneficial, Melanie asked a question, um, how did you start building your partnerships um, in the openly networked portion? Um, we started, so I moved to Hartford in 2014 um, to start this space. Um, within three months of me coming here, the space was open and I knew almost no one. Um, all of the partnerships that we built at first were in response to young people's needs. For instance, um, the story about um, Lisette and Joe is a true story. Um, Lisette came to me, she had a summer job, she had um, no way to get there. Um, I started searching online and asking around. We learned learned about a new program called VC Co. Um, we spotted her the 20 bucks to join the two-week program. She ended up with a bicycle. Um, then when she confided in Joe that she was interested in being a police officer, Joe came back to me and said, Lisette's reading level is at about the seventh grade level, even though she's a junior in high school. She's interested in being a police officer. Um, do you have any books that you could recommend that are close to that reading level that would also be of interest to her future like because of her future career path, right? Um, so everything everything starts with a young person asking for it. Um, you, we started a relationship with Planned Parenthood of Southern New England um, when after we got several requests for condoms, right? Um, we started a relationship with the Center for um, children's advocacy after we found out um, that one of our young people was experiencing unstable housing. Um, we started a relationship with the Hartford Public Schools Nutrition Department um, after, you know, several weeks of young people coming in in the summer asking if we had anything that they could possibly eat and running out of oatmeal over and over and over again. Um, so partnerships, um, Melanie, to wrap that up, is really about listening to what young people need and doing my best as a resource provider to provide those resources. Um, so Maria, um, yes, absolutely, we start exactly where patrons are. Um, and that is uh, the crux of one of the slides a little bit later, especially when it comes to working with teens. I think that's so important. Um, Meeting people, focusing on community needs, talking to teens who came in. Um, okay, okay. So, um, yeah, shared purpose is really important to gluing people together um, in a community. Natalia, I absolutely agree with that. Um, so let's actually just pick, um, okay, so reflecting on your current practice, um, have youth gravitated toward any of these? Um, if so, which one? And for those of you who are not responding, I think that's okay. I'm not uh, interested in calling anybody out on responding, but I do hope that you consider these things. Um, the, um, the act of reflecting and learning is really important. I know that this information is um, 
very foundational and kind of basic, um, but thinking about how it applies to your work, I think is the main benefit um, of our time together today. So reflecting on your current practice, um, have youth gravitated towards any of these learning or design principles that you've seen? If so, which one? And please share it either by um, speaking out or by typing it in the chat. Peer supported by far. Okay. Um, tell me why, Maria, why peer supported? Um, and then we also have David saying shared purpose. Um, and I'm going to ask you to elaborate on that too, just one or two sentences, please. Um, and after this last question, we'll move on to the next slide. Yes. Oh, Maria, great. Okay. If their peers are not interested, even if we have a ton of people, the attendance drops. Very true. Um, I, um, <laughs> I'm going to ask you to flip that on its head as a lesson that you can take from this. Um, if their peers are interested, the attendance will grow, right? Um, and so one of our um, primary approaches to um, supporting peers in working together um, is identifying influencers in a group. Um, generally, a group of young people has one or two people who are kind of directing the group, deciding whether or not the thing is cool enough to do, um, whether or not the thing is fun enough to do, or whether or not there's something else out there that is way better or way worse than this, um, and then thereby determining what that entire group does. Um, if you can get in good with that influencer, if you can get that influencer to take risks because they know that you care about them, because they know that you hear them, um, you can get that entire group of people, right? Um, so anytime you see that um, sentence structure, this is maybe nerdy, um, um, if this, then that, and you see a not in there, try removing the not, right? If the peers are interested, um, the attendance will grow. Um, and getting young people to be interested is um, as direct as figuring out who the influencer is and figuring out how to influence that influencer. Um, <laughs> yes, and David um, specifically said um, he is drawn to shared purpose. Um, which is really important. Um, it's easier to get a horse to water if you're both thirsty. We hire people because they love something, right? Um, the mentors who work in UMedia, the um, teen services or youth services librarian who work at our libraries are here because they are in love with something. And that passion absolutely shows you shows through. Um, if you think that the thing you love won't work in the library, I challenge you to challenge that. Um, most interests have a place in a library, um, barring extremes. Um, bring what you love to the library and people pick up on that. Um, yes, and Natalie, Natalia also um, says that interest is key with her group, um, when young people get to decide what's being discussed, what's being done, um, they are absolutely more interested. So moving on, we are going to talk a little bit about HAMAGO. Um, HAMAGO stands for Hangout, Mess Around, Geek Out. Um, it came out of Stanford University in 2009. Um, a woman named Mimi Ido, Ido um, whom I have an incredible professional crush on. Um, I saw her once at a conference, I turned bright red and stumbled through an opportunity to take a picture with her. Um, this is an observation of how young people interact um, with digital tools and content when there's no adult telling them what to do. Um, so <laughs> this can be awkward because you are an adult in a library with access to digital tools and how the heck are you supposed to get young people interested in these things if you can't tell them what to do? Um, well, let me help explain. Young people are going to start by hanging out with stuff. Um, and if you could, um, in the in the chat, please answer whether or not you heard of you have heard of this. Um, so please answer the question in the chat box. Have you heard of the Hamago learning theory? Um, so 
great. Um, so Hangout is basically, um, they're taking it in, right? They might be watching a movie, they might be reading a book, yes, libraries, um, they might be listening to music, um, or they might be visiting a gallery, right? Um, at some point, something in there catches their interest, um, and they really want to start messing around with it. They feel capable of changing it, making it better, um, doing it themselves, so they mod it, right? Um, maybe they try their hand at um, creating a video game um, level in Mario, some Mario Builder thing that they have. Sorry, I'm not good at video game names. Um, maybe they um, make a beat in GarageBand, or maybe they pick up a guitar and ask somebody in the space who knows how to strum a C chord. Um, and at some point, we hope um, that young people aim to geek out. That is, they want to be the person that their friends go to when they have questions. They want to be producing full length or professional quality things. Um, they want to be making money off of this. Um, and the key part of this, um, and I will repeat this a couple of times, is that hanging out is just as important as geeking out. Um, our young people are in the process of building their identities. These are the people that they will be for the rest of their lives. Um, and we should value that. Um, they're in the library, even if they're just hanging out, they are actively building identities as library goers, which means that in 50 years from now, if they need a lesson on how to use the latest machine that's not even called a computer anymore, they'll come to the library, right? Um, if they need access to a book or to a game or to some kind of learning, um, this foundational work as teenagers hanging out in the library can be the connection, that thread um, that helps them build that identity as a library goer. Um, Homago um, has some foundations. Homago and connected learning have some foundations um, in educational theory, um, specifically a theory called legitimate peripheral participation um, or um, communities of practice or situated learning. Um, there's kind of a bundle of ideas all together. Um, but Homago is what you would consider a trajectory, right? Um, so young people in your space, and you can probably put young people in both of these categories. Young people in your space or young people that you're working with are either headed um, toward the center of participation, they're becoming more and more active, um, or they're heading away from the center of participation. Maybe they're bucking the system a little bit. Um, maybe they are um, you know, um, not showing up very often. Um, you, as the adult, in the space are the people who facilitate their access to resources and you are the people that help support that trajectory. Um, I would encourage you to learn a little bit more about how your role as an adult in libraries, specifically working with young adults, can affect um, their ability to participate. Um, but we will move on for right now. Um, do you all have any questions about Homago or connected learning? Okay. Um, these are the last couple of kind of foundational slides, and then we're going to start really digging into programming. I'm going to try to move through this pretty quickly. Um, we meet our goals um, through very intentional relationships and very effective programming, right? Um, and I, the reason we're talking about um, this now is that I think relationships come first. Um, I'm not going to dive really deeply into this, but I would, again, encourage you to look into it. Um, Positive youth development and trauma-informed practice play a key part in the way that we work with young people. Um, the young person on your screen is Mark. Um, this is him actually four years ago um, during the grand opening of the U Media space at the library. Um, he's been with us for the last four years. He still comes to the library today. Um, and he's still playing video games at the library. Um, I would like to tell you that every single young person that we work with um, moves 
in a forward direction towards greater civic participation and increased skills and knowledge. Um, but the truth is that some of them are simply um, not interested in that, right? Um, and so we continue to meet them where they are. Um, despite coming to the library five days a week for the last four years, um, Mark is only interested in playing video games. And so as a library, we will help him do that thing. He brings friends here. Some of his friends end up participating in programs. Some of his friends have ended up being hired as um, interns with the library. Um, but that's where he is, and we're OK with him being there. Um, Trauma-informed practice is really about um, caring where young people have been. Um, a lot of our young people have grown up in poverty, and um, poverty is correlated very much so with adverse childhood experiences. Um, those experiences affect young people throughout their developmental life um, from birth through adulthood, right? Um, once that trauma hits, it affects the way their brains develop, it affects the way that they respond to you, um, it affects the way they feel about themselves, about their community and how they fit into places. Um, and so we are very careful about where they've been. Um, we also want to support where they're going. Um, we don't know if Mark is going to end up working full time eventually or if he wants to go to college. Um, I know actually that he's not interested in going to college. Um, and while I think that college was a good decision for me, um, it's not up to me for, to decide for Mark. Um, I just want to support um, the decisions that he is making. I want to um, help him be in control of his own life, right? Um, I would like to give um, one example of this. So we have a teen advisory council who guided us through creating a reintegration procedure for youth who broke our trust and were removed from the space for a period of time. Um, this happens very rarely, um, maybe uh, four or five times since we opened four years ago. Um, the reintegration process that the youth decided on includes writing a letter of apology, um, intensive one-on-one -on -one mentoring um, and graduated access to the space. Um, so young people um, will spend a certain number of time with a mentor um, and uh, then eventually we'll be able to come into the space just to work with that mentor. Um, after that, they are able to come into the space just to participate in their workshops even though it's not one-on-one -on -one anymore. Um, and after that, they are able to come into the space um, freely as before. Um, um, this kind of peer supported um, caring um, has worked really well. Um, a young man, this is a very recent story. Um, a couple of years ago, a young man stole a phone from the space. Um, the police were called because we had it on video um, and he was saying that he didn't do it. Um, he unfortunately had an outstanding warrant um, he was arrested at the library. It might um, be like the single worst day of my professional career. Um, I was devastated um, about this young man um, being in so much trouble. Um, however, um, after he was able to come back to the library, um, we did ask him to stay away from the library for a year. Um, he decided to go through the reintegration process. He worked under our music production mentor, um, recently turned in a proposal to volunteer in the space, and we are very likely um, to ask for a few adjustments to his proposal and then approve that request. Um, I'm not sure, I have a billion other things to say about that, but I'm not going to because it's 1140 and you guys care about programs too. Um, but, but being like, be cool to your youth um, because they are capable and they're in the process of deciding who they are. They are not set in stone yet. Um, and if you have a young people who's challenging the crap out of everything that you want to do, that kid could be a leader. Um, and that kid just needs an opportunity to demonstrate their skills going forward um, in order to completely change their trajectory. Um, and you are the adult that can be responsible for that. So please do that. Um, we do, I do have some specific resources on trauma informed practice. Um, I didn't include them in this because it's a pretty deep dive. Um, I will, um, I will send those to you afterwards if that's okay, Melanie. Thank you for asking. Um, we have these posters all over the wall. Um, relationships 
uh, it can sometimes get stressed um, and sometimes uh, having a motivational poster sets the stage for a culture of support and encouragement. Um, <laughs> Etsy. <laughs> I got these all on Etsy. Um, you can download them and print these um, giant. Um, I know uh, libraries have this tendency to um, lean on ALA, who, in case you're listening, ALA does some really great work with marketing and branding. Um, some of that work is not always age appropriate for teens and young adults. We are competing with a lot of really beautiful images. Um, and go out there, um, like each of these are $2 maybe, and you can print them a billion times. Um, and then you can use them in presentations. Uh, so consider your audience, um, make it beautiful, um, make it encouraging. Um, the uh, Post your values all over the walls um, and make sure that youth know that you value them um, in your words and actions as well. Um, you may, I'm not gonna go through everything that I wrote in the notes of the slides, but you will have the slides. Um, I'll make sure, Melanie, that you have them in a format that actually opens. And um, I would encourage you to read this slide. Um, it's really about being cool to your youth. Um, okay, so programming. Um, this is Roe. Roe is super into music production, um, and our recording studio attracts um, writers, rappers, singers, beat makers, producers, videographers, b-boys, performers. Um, <laughs> people are standing in line for the recruit for the studio before it opens. Um, they are the last people to leave. Um, they are all trying to tell a local story, um, their own kind of local story, right? Um, Ro got connected to us through a program, right? The music production program. Um, so his first touch with this space was interest-based. He wanted to make music. We were here to make music. Um, he probably would have put up with a lot of nonsense in order to be allowed to make music, but we never made him put up with that nonsense, right? He wanted to be a musician. He spends he spent all his time making music um, and then started teaching other people how to use the equipment. He released an EP on SoundCloud. He's performed at several local events. Um, his stage name is Bro God. Um, and I say that to reiterate our approach to supporting youth's interests, right? This is not about us making the library look good. This is about Ro being bro god on stage and doing the thing that he super loves and us being there as backups. Um, in an earlier version of um, this slide, the explanation about Ro stopped here, um, but our relationship with Ro has not ended. Um, earlier this year, Ro and his girlfriend, um, both of them undocumented immigrants in America, had a baby. Um, after a thorough round of considering their options um, with people inside the library who they consider mentors and of course with family and other friends, um, they ended up moving to the Netherlands to be near Ro's extended family. Um, in the next iteration of this presentation, the story will go even further because Roe is still in touch. The point here is that these are long-term relationships you're building with young people who need supportive adults that help them think critically about their decisions and their lives. You have a mobile lab full of equipment. That equipment is just the thing that you do while you're getting to know these youth, right? That equipment is just the thing that they have to connect to you right now until you have built that stronger foundation. Um, oh, man, I... I wrote uh, in the slide that I wanted somebody to tell me a story about one of your youth. Um, we do not have time for that right now, but I bet you all have them. And I'm going to encourage you to send those stories instead of right now um, to my email afterwards. Um, I would love to hear about the young people um, that you are working with. Um, so here, here, comes, here comes the big stuff. Um, I am going to copy and paste a slew of links into the chat, um, and then we are going to move through some of them together. Um, so the first thing that you have access to is all of our program plans. Um, the These are all of the program plans, I think, for the last two years since we kind of revamped the system. Um, the second link that you have right there is um, the program planning form. 
the program planning form is how we submit programs to be considered. Um, um, the third is the program reflection form. Um, the reflection form is how we report data about programs. Um, the next link is our program, so summer.hplct.org. Hold a, a public calendar of all of the programs that are happening, and there are a lot. Um, and then the program data dashboard um, is where you can find data about all of our programs. We lean really, really heavily on Google, in case you hadn't noticed. Um, we basically use Google Forms, Google Drive, um, and data, Google's Data Studio um, to do all of our administrative work with programs. Um, so, um, I am going to um, I am going to Oops, where's the thing? Okay. Okay. I am saying you can use those. Yes, absolutely. Um, well, okay. So when I'm saying you can use these, I am saying <laughs> um, that the program plans can absolutely be used. Um, uh, the program planning form and the program reflection, I would recommend that you make a copy of. Um, and use on your own. Otherwise, I will have access to everything that you do, um, and it could get a little bit messy on the, you know, the kind of Google organization backend. Um, but you can see how we do this. Um, so here, um, you can see all of the program plans that we have. Um, if you go into summer 2018, you even have um, documents for a Hartford scavenger hunt. If you're ever in Hartford, you could go ahead and do this scavenger hunt. Um, these are programs that our employees submitted. Um, for sure, they have not all been um, deeply spell checked. Um, they have all, though, been implemented, um, and they are here because they are effective. Um, there is that. So um, I'm not going to go through a whole bunch of the program plans. Um, you should know that we have them um, divided by engagement level. So um, there are Hangout programs that are available all the time. Um, we have a Hangout program available at every branch at all times that does not require very much staff support um, and is not terribly messy. Um, the picture um, that you could see before this, um, the poetry is was one of our hangout programs, right? So um, you could do blackout poetry, um, you could do magnetic poetry, um, you could just write your own poetry, and then we actually created um, this little poetry at each of the branches um, where young people's work was displayed for everybody to see. Um, this was connected to a larger library initiative, um, the um, Big Read this year. Um, we got funding to work with um, the book Citizen by Claudia Rankine, which is about microaggressions. So um, a lot of the programs had kind of heavy undertones, right? Um, but still ended up being very beautiful um, programs um, that young people were really excited to participate in. Um, let me get this guy back up here. Um, so the youth program planning form, um, we offer uh, programs in four content areas, um, STEM, Lit, Life Skills, Arts and Entertainment. Um, then, of course, the engagement levels, you can see Hamago right there, um, in three different age ranges. Um, before we do, and I'm just going to go ahead and do one of these so I could show you. Um, Um, so description for the calendar and objectives. So we want learning objectives, right? Um, definitely these <laughs> would not say something like win. Um, they would start with an action verb. They would result in some kind of product um, or skill, knowledge, or behavior that a young person um, or their family would walk away with. Um, we have these um, aligned to um, ALA's 21st century goals. Um, so what kind of learning skills are these critical, creative, collaborating, communicating? Um, what kind of literacy skills are folks practicing? And what kind of life and career skills are they practicing, right? Um, these are not exhaustive. Um, ALA has a whole bunch more goals that you can look at. These are the ones that we felt were best aligned to the programs that we generally run. 
Um, and then, of course, we have supplies that you need, um, an outline um, so that somebody else can run the program, and resources for continued exploration. So what books would you tie into this? Websites or local organizations would you connect um, to ensure that um, folks can continue going past the program? Right, um, and then we would submit, and we end up with um, a huge selection. Um, I think we have over 300 um, individual programs right now, um, celebrating everything from Teen Read Week to um, De Dios Niños, uh, everything in between. Um, any questions about program planning before I talk about the calendar? Um, for a couple of seconds and then talk a little bit about the reflection and what it's good for. Um, some basic broader stuff, um, we plan programs on a quarterly basis and everybody shares everything. Um, they will submit an idea, there is a round of iteration and then they will submit their full program. Um, every quarter we, um, the Youth Services Director and I choose several programs that are required, but most of them are optional. Um, there's a minimum of one program per age group per week and um, one hangout happening all the time. Um, so there are, and this structure is actually listed in the slides on the poetry slide so that you can see, um, you can see what that looks like. Oops, I keep hitting the buttons. Oops, okay. Sorry, everybody. Okay, there we go. Okay, um, so um, when we finish running a program, we reflect, um, who are you? What was the name of the title? What was the group? Um, who presented it? We do have partners come in. Um, we wanna make sure that we're collecting information about the partners that people bring in. Bring in. Um, what date was it? Um, where did it happen? Um, who participated? We get as granular as um, figuring out what the age range was of the participants. Um, and then we collect qualitative feedback too, right? Um, what feedback did you hear from participants? Um, or what was it like for you? If this is something that is not working, please tell that to us so that we can adjust the program because we're asking other people to do this too. Um, and then we check whether or not it's an outreach program or a library-based program. Um, and we have a partnership with the schools called Boundless that I won't talk about, um, but we collect um, data on those programs separately. All of that data <laughs> ends up feeding into this page that's not here right now. Um, hmm. This is an interesting development. Um, give me a second to see what's happening here. You know, I absolutely took, I had a picture, a screenshot of this on here. And it is not opening. Um, okay, so um, unfortunately I can't um, show this to you right now um, and I'm not sure why. But if you hit up this link, uh, you should be able to get to this. I should be able to get to this, um, and I can't, so we'll figure out that later. Um, but this is a link to our data dashboard, right? Um, we, um, link is broken. Super interesting. I will have to figure that out. Um, I don't have I don't have a solution right now. Um, so that's fine. Okay. So, um, we went through program planning. Uh, program. You can see uh, the calendar on the website. Um, we have a really robust set of programs that happen. Um, if you click on the calendar link in our um, summer learning webpage, uh, which you can see up at the top here, um, 
All of these at the top are the Hangouts that are happening, so they're available all the time. Um, and then each of these individual programs are the programs that are happening. Um, this is not ideal. Um, ideally, I would separate these out into different age groups. At least they um, would be color-coded like they are in the actual Google Calendar, but the translation here doesn't translate colors. Um, but you can see the number of programs that we're running um, on any given day is pretty significant. Um, if you switch to the agenda view, um, you can get a pretty good idea of what um, is happening um, through throughout the library. Um, Sirius Coyote um, plays music and then we'll serve summer lunch and we'll 3D print, um, we'll plant things, we'll write six word stories, um, we'll build with strawbies, we'll take photos of um, nature around our neighborhoods, um, we'll meditate and do yoga. Um, we, um, we'll do a billion things <laughs> and it'll be so much fun. Um, and all of these programs um, are available in, um, all of these programs are available in the resources that I just shared with you. Um, okay, I have talked for an incredibly long time. Um, sorry. <laughs> um, so now um, I'm actually, um, I'm gonna go ahead and leave you um, with this. Um, the only important thing here is my email address. Um, so if you want to write that down really quickly, go ahead, because um, I'm about I'm going to remove this slide so that I can actually put on our warm and fuzzy slideshow while I offer to answer any questions that you have. Um, so T George at hplct.org. I'm gonna type it in here um, so that I can get rid of this. Um, if you have questions, um, if you have a story about your youth, I'm very interested in hearing that. Um, but I also do um, want to share um, a warm and fuzzy slideshow with you while while I answer any questions. Um, thank you all for your time today. Um, I hope this was useful, even in, in a tiny way. Um, do you have any questions? How how can I help? Questions, anyone? Patrick, did you want to say a little bit about um, maybe some of the what a some of the patrons that you've worked with? Anybody want to share? I think I think that that is okay. Um, how big is our teen area? Um, great question. I think it is approximately um, 2,000 square feet. We are, the number that I do know is that the fire marshal says 216 people are allowed to be in there at the same time. Wow. Um, we also, though, have um, programming kits um, that we put in shoe boxes. Um, I imagine the, the um, mobile program kits that Melanie told me about are probably a lot more extensive than ours. Um, but uh, we don't always do work with people in a single space. We also go out to schools, we go out to um, community organization fairs, um, we take our kits to other libraries. Um, so to answer your question, plus a little bit more that you might not have wanted to know. Can you tell me a little bit of, about how you've connected with the schools? Yeah, um, that could be like a whole presentation in itself. So we have a partnership with the schools called Boundless. Um, and what that means is that we, um, oh, Natalia, killer question. Um, let me get to that. Um, so when we, um, 
so we do it in a couple of different ways. We have boundless, um, which means that we have an MOU with the public schools in the area. Um, we get all of their reading lists for the summer and ensure that we have sufficient books for kids to read the books that are on those reading lists. Um, our youth services librarians do outreach to specific classrooms. Um, sometimes we take a kind of prefab curriculum like um, Crazy Eights um, bedtime math. Um, sometimes we take things that we've dreamed up all on our own. Um, out to those classrooms. We also work with a local organization called Hartford Performs that pays teaching artists to go into classrooms. Um, we use that as a revenue generating opportunity where we send the mentors from new media and sometimes new services librarians into classrooms as teaching artists. Um, they will do, um, they will do um, a billion different things. Um, a stop motion animation is a good example. We'll do a two hour workshop in the classroom to do stop motion animation, and then they'll come to the library to hang out um, in the team space for um, a three hour field trip without their teachers. Um, so um, that is how, that is part of how we connect to the schools. Um, how do you make a library team centric? when it has never been teen focused and may even have policies that deter teen presence. Um, we, this was, um, I'm trying, <laughs> I am trying to avoid words like battle and fight. Um, um, <laughs> I guess the closest word that is um, not those words is struggle. Um, so that was a struggle that we had for the first couple of years. Um, one of the things that was really important was um, to have increased communication and support for the relationship between um, me, who was in charge of the team space, um, and the head of security, who was responsible for the security guards, who were most often the people annoyed um, at having teams in this space. Um, the second thing that was really important to do was to make really clear um, to the teens, but also to the adults working at the library, um, how behavior expectations were different inside you media and outside you media. Um, not all libraries have that um, benefit um, of having a separate space. Um, and so um, we were able to say, you know, when you're in here, um, you're allowed to eat, you're allowed to catapult over things, and you are allowed to swear within reason. Um, when you are outside the library, all of those things are forbidden, and they are outside of my, like, realm of control, right? Um, so you can do those things in the rest of the library, but I do not have any say about what happens um, to you and your presence at the library if you do those things outside the space. Um, the other thing that was really important um, is to write down um, the kind of behaviors that we expect in you media um, and standardize an approach to dealing with them, right? Um, so we have a document that I can share with you called um, Common Behaviors and Standard Responses. It covers things like what to do when a young person um, is producing a really beautiful piece of art. Like how do you approach that young person? Um, but it also covers what to do um, if a young person is getting a little bit too aggressive with their language. Um, all of the responses are intended to build community um, and point to the community as um, to protecting the community and the culture that we have, um, rather than addressing it as an individual behavior, right? Um, so for instance, we had a young man named Nate who loved to play video games, and more than video games, he loved to swear very loudly while he played video games. Um, our, um, I would never say anything to him more than two times in a row before I passed that off to another mentor to ensure that my relationship with Nate stayed positive. Um, and then, um, Eventually, after a couple of days of us saying, hey, this is like not the way that we do things here and him continuing to do it, um, we recognized it as an attention-seeking behavior. We pulled him into a conversation with all of the mentors um, and asked him what was going on. Um, we learned a lot about Nate's life that day um, and about the reasons that he was swearing so aggressively um, and about insights into how we could remind him um, gently um, that we needed him to behave in a a slightly more um, conducive way, um, if that makes sense. Um, I have, Natalia, I have a billion, I have a billion more responses to your question because it's something that we um, struggled with pretty thoroughly. Um, I do wanna say, um, not allowed to hang out, which drives you crazy. They have to be in programs or looking at books or doing something educational. Um, one of um, 
this is a crazy double standard. Um, nobody walks up to adults in a library who are sitting looking at their phones and ask them if they're doing something important. You would not even dream of doing that. If adult comes to the library just to hang out, an adult is allowed to hang out at the library and it should be the same for our teens. Um, there are gonna be arguments and negotiations about age ranges, right? Like when is a teen allowed to be in the space without a parent? Is it 13? Is it 10? Is it eight? Is it as soon as they can reach the desk? Um, you know, are you actually going to call the police if you find a nine-year-old in the library who doesn't have a parent there if the, if the nine-year-old is behaving appropriately, right? So there's a lot, um, there's like this weird kind of slippery slope thing that happens and this weird double standard thing that happens. Um, I have pointed several times to um, expectations of adults in the library um, being similar to that of teens. If a young person comes here to hang out, they should be welcome to hang out in the library. Um, and then being able to point at those things like, why should they be able to just hang out in the library? Well, because they're building an identity as a library goer, um, because this is a safe space, um, because they can be productive here if they choose to be, because how do you know they're not being productive right now? Um, because how do you know they even have somewhere else to go right now? Um, being the adult that pushes a young person out of an environment rich with learning opportunities and resources is not the adult that you want to be. <laughs> and if you have those adults in your space, um, that should be a top priority for addressing. Um, Patrick, it sounds like you are doing really, really cool stuff. Um, the how do teens, how do your teens respond to people like international producers? Melanie, are are you, am I? Um, I'm jumping off the time cliff here. I'm sorry. You don't have a problem with it if you don't. <laughs> okay, I have. Um, I can stay probably until twelve twenty. Um, but then the. I have to, my, the water company is going to turn off my water if I don't let them change the meter. Okay. <laughs> Wait until the last minute on that one. Um, so I am curious about, um, I'm curious, Patrick, about the um, international producers coming in and how youth respond to them. Um, I've been in positions um, very uncomfortable before. Um, okay. Okay, so you're friends with the people that do that. Okay, and how do the youth like it? Um, maybe while Patrick is responding, if anybody else has questions um, or if anybody else is interested in mining any more resources that we have, um, libraries are for sharing things for free. Um, and I am more than willing to um, lean into that practice. That's just so awesome to hear. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where would we be if we couldn't get information for nothing? Exactly. Exactly. With that in mind, does anybody have any? Go, go ahead. Okay, super, super. Okay. That's good. I might try to touch base with you a little bit later. I've brought in people before. Um, maybe it was the field, um, the computer scientists, to talk to young people about their work. Um, and the general um, consensus was that that was boring. Um, so I might, um, I might have a couple of things to learn from you about how you structure those interactions. Thank you for sharing, Patrick. Oh, video games and video game designers, so fun. Please share pictures if you do that. Oh, you know what, Maria? I have a, um, I have this really cool thing that I might be able to share from you. Have you guys heard of the Allied Media Conference? No. Um, they did, uh, I went to this really great session about um, video games um, and how to use them in like educational ways. Um, hold on, let me see, development professional. Okay. So it was actually called um, Game Curious. Um, open the Google Drive. Um, 
Oops, now how do I get a share? Um, yes, I have that, um, I have that system, Patrick, um, and it is super fun, um, and they do love it. Um, the, there are also a ton, a ton, a ton, a ton of free game building tools, and if I remember correctly, the link that I just shared with you has a whole bunch of those resources connected to it, um, things like Twine, um, stencil. Um, there are a lot of options um, for doing low cost um, but robust game design with young people. Um, okay. Um, if there is nothing else, um, I want to say again, thank you so much for your time. Please send me a story about your youth. Um, that's kind of what I get out of this is knowing that um, other young pe other people are doing really cool stuff um, with young people. Um, and I'll probably end up talking about you <laughs> if you send um, something cool. Um, oh, yes, 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 yes. I'll do that. You know what? I'll just do it right now. Um, um, okay. So do you have it? So these are standards that you share with behavior, standards for behaviors. Uh-huh, yep. Well, um, they are uh, common behaviors and standard responses. So um, in our space, we have one rule. Our rule is act right. Um, we tell young people to act like good humans. Um, and as long as they're doing that, we are all good. Um, the um, <laughs> way that we um this document is the way that we kind of enforce that i do hope my water doesn't get turned off yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, i opened that final letter and was like okay <laughs> sorry sorry um, okay for some reason i cannot get this to let me um let me just go into my google drive to find it because that's not working the way that i want to Okay. Um, and then this will be, there we go. Um, let me know if that, it should work fine. Um, but you can see the, um, Right. Um, go ahead. You see Natalia's question there, or her uh, her connection lag, oh. so she can hear the rule that you said. The rule is act right. Um, you know, there's all of this like attempt to you know like okay, so like teachers do this thing where young people are using their phones in their classrooms, so they ban cell phones. Well, that's not the real world. That's not how that works. Right? If you take your phone out too many times in the real world, you lose your job. You get hit by a car. You crash. Like, um, there are real world, real consequences um, for doing the things um, that uh, there are policies related to. Right? So we're going to take out the policies and just give you the real world consequences. Right? Like you come in here acting like a reasonable human, and everybody else is going to act like a reasonable human with you. Right? Um, if you come in here um, and you are um, being mean. Um, something happened. What happened? Like, like, let us help you work out those feelings, right? Um, I don't need to tell you to be nice. You already know that. Um, just let me help you be nice when you feel like you can't be. Um, or just like come in here and be cool with us, um, and we'll be cool back to you. I mean, if you can't be, we'll help you. That's the that's the whole thing. Um, yes. Um Thank you so much for your willingness to come and share with us all your experiences and all your resources. It's really 
invaluable and I, I really am looking forward to you know getting some of this stuff in action um again thank you for taking yeah. the time to turn with us no worries i love this stuff um i love young people i love people who work with young people so this is all so much fun for me um you have my email address, you know my name, I hope. Um, if you have any questions, if you have any ideas, if you have any feedback, um, please let me know. I would love to hear it. Also, please, again, send me stories about your young people. I want to hear them. Awesome. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Yep. Have a great day, Melanie. Thanks so much for having me, and good luck to all of you. Awesome. You too. Thanks, cool. guys, for coming, too. Look forward to seeing you tomorrow in our um, Techno Mocha discussion group. Bye. Have a great day.